Good afternoon and welcome to our first Lunch and Learn webinar of 2021, presented by the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. For over 100 years, the museum has been committed to providing a wide variety of educational programs for the community. And even though both the museum and the Sea Center are reopened for visitors, both inside and out of doors, we're gonna to continue to provide programs virtually. And thus, today's workshop, Plan While You Can, strategize your personal property in estate planning. Our plan giving officer, Rochelle Rose, and all of our colleagues here in the development department have been hard at work planning this informative workshop with two wonderful museum volunteers, Denise Stevens and Elizabeth Stewart. Now, let me acknowledge that these are extraordinary times as we work our way out of the COVID-19 pandemic and all of the disruptions it has caused in our lives. All of us are thinking more about our own health, mortality, and what kind of legacy we wish to leave, thus this webinar. Now, while I do hope, of course, that you will consider naming the museum in your estate so that we can continue to provide education, wonder, and delight for visitors of all ages, it's most important that you just plan for the years beyond your time here so that your life's assets do good things into the future. So this will be an information packed hour. We'll provide lots of useful insights and advice. Thank you for your attendance and for your interest in the museum. So let's get started, Rochelle. Thank you. That was Luke Swetland, the president and CEO of the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. Thank you for the great introduction, Luke. I, I am a Rochelle Rose, Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History Development Officer and Legacy Giving, and we're happy to share with you this free webinar, webinar with helpful information on the aspect of personal property in your estate plans. We will start with presentations by our two expert speakers. Time has been allotted at the end for questions as well. Please place your questions in the chat uh, function, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. And please note that the presenters are not attorneys and we will not any individual legal advice. The two, two handouts were included in your invitation today. Two additional handouts will be sent to registrants in a day or two, including a link to the recording. If, if you should have any technical issues during today's program, please email Sarah at s Clement at sbnature2.org. This email address was also included in your meeting notification today. And feel free to reach out to me if you have any planned giving questions or need more information from me or the co-speakers. There will be a final slide with contact information. I'm here to help you leave your legacy. Hopefully you will keep the museum in mind in your planning. And here's some short bio information regarding our speakers today. Denise Stevens is a former plan giving and financial professional who retired from a large nonprofit. She previously worked for various Fortune 500 companies, including Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Transamerica, and Dean Witter. She earned double BA degrees from UCLA and a master's degree in organizational behavior and development from Cal University. Denise serves as chair of the museum's plan giving advisory committee. Dr. Elizabeth Stewart is a 30 year expert in the world of material culture. She works as an appraiser of art and valuable personal property here in Santa Barbara and beyond. A certified member of the Appraisers Association of America, she has spent a lifetime in the world of personal belongings and in archives, libraries, and museum accession rooms. Dr. Stewart holds a degree in history from Tufts University, an honors thesis in architectural history from the University of Edinburgh, Scotland, and accomplished her internship at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. She holds a master's in historic preservation and public history from the University of San Diego and a doctorate from Pacifica Graduate University and in mythology. So Denise, the audience is yours. Hello, everyone. Let me first explain why we decided to talk about this topic. 
As Luke mentioned, the past year has made us all even more aware of the need for proper estate planning for ourselves and all those we love. When we think about estate plan documents, this typically includes wills and trusts, powers of attorney for both finance and healthcare, um, and an advanced directive is more common these days in healthcare, perhaps some other healthcare documents and a way to deal with the personal non-titled property such as clothing and jewelry. A lot of things go into thinking about the legal documents and overall estate planning. So I like to think of this much as a three-legged stool with all the legs in good condition uh, without all the legs in good condition is it's not effective to carry the weight of your wishes. But dealing with the transfer of untitled property in your estate is typically the most overlooked or most un misunderstood aspect of planning. Yet it's just as important as the transfer of title property. Ob objects hold symbolism and distributing the stuff can potentially lead to more conflict and resentment than titled property. That is why we wanted to talk to you today about planning for this while you can. Various challenges include the fact that items hold a different meaning to various loved ones. There can be different perceptions of what is fair. There is sentimental value versus monetary value. Uh, there can be communication hurdles and family dynamics surface. There are often contradictory instructions or promises, or the entire subject is just disregarded until a crisis occurs. Let me share a couple of stories to illustrate this. Uh, a son I know about told his mother years before she died that he wanted the grandfather clock that had been in the family for generations. It was very special to him. She told him, it's yours when I'm gone. A few months before she passed, the daughter also asked her for the clock and was told it would be hers when mom passed. A few days after the mother's death, the son was wheeling the grandfather clock out the front door and lo and behold, his sister shows up. The confrontation turned into an actual fist fight followed by a broken grandfather clock and a ruptured relationship between siblings. Mom never intended to cause the conflict she just failed to plan for its potential. And we have so many blended families today. I want to tell you about my friend, Jill. Her parents divorced during her teens. Her father retained all the things he had inherited from his own mother and grandmother. Her, her mother, likewise, kept antiques from her own Greek ancestors. They each later remarried. Neither birth parent affected a plan that would protect their adult children and nothing binding was ever done about any of these personal property items. They simply trusted that everything would work out okay. Um, but both parents ended up predeceasing their new spouses uh, and everything went to the new spouses and those spouses heirs. Jill heard about an estate sale involving her mother's um, antiques and showed up uninvited. She dragged her grandmother's rocking chair across the front yard to her car, yelling at her stepfather and his family that they had no right, and then searched the house looking for her childhood dresser. Jill has no relationship with her stepparents or their children following this. And to this very day, uh, the mere mention of the subject dredges up resentment, sadness, anxiety, and feelings of injustice. I was gonna also tell you a story from my own family. I'm gonna skip the gory details and just basically say that when my Ohio grandmother passed away, she left her house and everything in it to one son uh, who had lived there with her in her older years, even though she had 10 adult children and many grandchildren. He had no children and when he passed, he left it to his favorite brother who later gave it to his favorite sister. To this day, I really don't know uh, what happened to any of the things there or whether that was my grandmother's intent or not. When you fail to include non-titled property as part of your overall estate decision-making, 
unpleasant surprises like this occur and can occur in many cases. So as we age and we're faced with inheritance or lifetime gift decisions, including on title property, uh, we just need to get to it and deal with the stuff. So let me explain a few more things uh, to ensure we're all on the same page. The main characteristic of personal property is that it is movable, unlike real estate. Personal property is actually classified in categories as tangible or intangible. Tangible personal property has physical substance. You can touch it, hold it, feel it. This will include household furnishings, antiques, jewelry, books, dishes, quilts, clothes, sports equipment, uh, dolls, stamp collections, family photos, art, you get the idea. Intangible personal property cannot be handled and its value in stems from intangible elements. Examples would be patents, copyrights, licenses, musical compositions, customer lists, your Twitter account. But today we're just going to focus on tangible personal property because this concerns most people. So how do we pass our tangible personal property? Well, ultimately you have a choice. You cannot address the issue at all, uh, like Jill's parents, hoping your heirs will get together and amicably agree on how to divide things up. You can address the issue informally with a non-binding letter or verbal things and trust that your heirs will honor the informality. Or you can address the issue formally by including clear information uh, in your legal estate documents. This will help ensure that specific specific people and organizations get what the items you want them to get. Uh, and it's especially helpful if your heirs may disagree over things. So there are different vehicle options uh, or methods. Yeah. Bequests in your will, maintaining a list of personal property items along with designated heirs, making charitable bequests and selling items uh, that then become part of the residue of your state. Uh, but every distribution option has certain consequences. Ethan. Let me explain a bit more. So when you make a general gift in your will, this is a description that's not really enough to associate with one particular item. For example, you can say, I give one of my cars to my son, Bob. Uh, any car that you own would satisfy that gift. Note here that also in equal shares language often just transfers the problem to your uh, executor. So you can make specific gifts in your will. You clearly identify or describe an item uh, to avoid confusion over what's being named. For example, I give my blue 2019 Toyota Prius to my son, Bob. That would be a specific gift. Wills also typically have a real and residue provision that deals with uh, the property left over after you've made specific and general gifts. For example, the will might state, I leave all the rest of my property to my niece, Michelle. But be aware that the difference between specific general and residual gifts become very important. For example, when one gift requirement is not satisfied, uh, maybe you chose to give a certain ring a specific gift, but no longer possess the ring at the time of your death. Well, it could affect the entire chain of property distribution, especially residual gifts. There could also be some unintended tax liabilities in certain instances where a specific gift was not made and an item passes into the residue but is then subs subsequently given to an heir. Um, so it's important that any personal gifts that are drafted are drafted clearly and carefully so that your wishes can be carried out. And this is especially true um, when the beneficiaries of your, the residuary are different than the benef beneficiaries of your tangible personal property. And this would include a careful reference 
to any tangible personal property in your safety deposit box. Um, you can also uh, affect what's called a property memorandum or list. Under the laws of most states, you're permitted to make a separate list of tangible personal items. Uh, this would specifically be referenced in your will. By referencing it in your will, it makes it legally binding. The list must be signed and dated, and it must describe the personal property and name the recipients by name and address. The obvious advantage is that such a list um, gives you the ability to buy, sell, give away, or change your mind by simply updating the list rather than redrafting your entire will. Only the last list you've completed before your death will be valid. Since the requirements for enforceable personal property lists vary from state to state, use a document that defines the personal property with some specificity and complies with local law. Also keep in mind that your list should not conflict with any other writ written documents. And if some items on your list are very valuable, especially art and collections, it's important to discuss this transfer with your professional advisors first. You can also transfer personal property into your living trust if you choose to do so by executing a bill of sale, listing the personal property being transferred. The property would then be owned by you as trustee of your trust instead of by you individually. To the extent that valuable personal property is being conveyed into your trust, consider providing a detailed description of the item and possibly include a picture to minimize any ambiguity. A lot of people also want a gift now. They start the process during your life. You may want to downsize or give away certain items to individuals or organizations before it becomes an estate matter. Giving now gives you the chance to talk about your memories and share experiences. Um, so that your heirs understand and better appreciate the gift. It can also minimize the state difficulties and streamline the process later. Giving now can include distrib distribution days when you get together with family or dear friends to provide an opportunity to select items. Um, you can utilize auctions or sales now. Giving can also include, as I said, a charitable gift. Um, and Elizabeth is going to say more about this momentarily. All of these methods and options have consequences and implications. For example, an auction or yard sale is less private, is less private, and a legacy item may accidentally be included. Someone may not get what they want in a family item by item dis distribution gathering. And remember, if there's no will or the will cannot be found, as recently happened with my cousin Ron, determinations might be up to your state's intestacy rules and leave your family in turmoil. There's also a few other important considerations, such as what do you actually want to accomplish? Do you want to maintain privacy, preserve memories, reward someone, contribute to society? Are these goals shared? Uh, this will help drive decisions. Would outside help be beneficial, such as an appraiser or a fiduciary? What's, what is value? And then are value and worth the same thing? And how do you consider sentimental value? Uh, and negotiating both fair outcomes and fair processes is highly beneficial to the process. And being fair does not always mean being equal. So now I'd like to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Elizabeth Stewart, for more of her perspective. Elizabeth? There, hi guys, it's Elizabeth. So uh, can you see this? All right, so I said to my son, I'd like to leave this to you. And what did my son say? He said, no thanks, and I'll tell you why. I didn't tell him the story about it. Now, an estate planner I work with said there are two outcomes to giving objects to heirs. They don't want them or they fight over them. So how can these two unfortunate outcomes be avoided? If anyone listening has the following mental conditions, you need to think about this topic now. Okay, A, the kids and I have discussed independently who wants what 
there's no plan yet. B, the kids really do not know why certain objects are family heirlooms. C, my son doesn't want anything. D, I am moving and the kids do not want to know. E, I have a will that simply says, divide the stuff amongst the kids. F, the kids and I have different tastes and I bet they have no idea what my junk is worth. G, I thought about estate planning for the valuable things, but to get started, I have to unload so much extra stuff. Well, we have seen friends and family leave the planet recently. So mortality is on our minds. And along with the realization that life may be short, many of my clients have asked me what they can do right now about pulling a plan together for an estate distribution of personal property. Therefore, there are a few important ways to get started this weekend. Number one, make an inventory and make it easy for yourself by recording a narrated tour around your home. Number two, without going through the kitchen drawers to weed out the extra detritus, your junk, make a narrative video of only your very best stuff. Send this to the kids without stating a dollar figure, for example, or give it to your executor. Number three, hire me to write an appraisal for equitable distribution where all your best stuff is listed and send that to the kids for selection purposes with or without dollar figures stated. Write an informal letter of distribution and hope that your wishes do not cause problems. So you could also tape names on the back of valuable objects uh, and hope that one daughter-in-law in particular does not rip those labels off and you know whom I'm speaking about. Make one separate video, point five, recording just the sentimental objects and why they matter to the family. Number six, make an intro video that indicates to your family the difference between value and worth of certain objects. And this is a big point. So let me illustrate two sisters I counseled fought irreconcilably over mom's egg cup which was valued at around $2. How this could have been avoided is that, and this is a joke, mom could have said, you know, it really doesn't matter to me much. I always hated eggs in the morning. Number seven, try your hardest not to let the small stuff matter as in life in estate planning. The less significant the object, the more psychic space it occupies. And forget about the masses of things that you intend to give to Goodwill at this point. Concentrate on the best objects first. You can leave that junk to the kids because they usually do not fight over that. They usually hire someone to liquidate it and don't look back. Number eight, if you send out a Dropbox with a narrated video and you hear nothing back from your kids, or you hear moans, or nobody wants anything, or just a few things, now you know the monstrosity of the task ahead and you can plan to donate, sell, foist objects on your friends, either now or when you leave the planet. And this is why this matters. When emotions run high after a death and when large dollar figures are added to the emotional climate, siblings who loved each other suddenly do not. And since you're listening to me, you are currently on the planet and you have the opportunity to create a letter of intent or better yet meet with your estate attorney to formalize a method of giving valuables to your heirs. He or she may suggest an appraisal for valuable items for a few salient reasons. And here I give the disclaimer that I am not a tax or a state attorney. Certain behests, as Denise mentioned, may go into your will either generally or specifically. And there's residue language too. How to divide up the general gifts in a will is the question. 
Well, my estate attorney suggested a basis of distribution, which involved getting people around the table and pulling straws. Okay, there's also the first age first basis. So the eldest goes first, et cetera. Or one I particularly like is only the grandkids get to choose basis. Number two, selling valuable objects with proceeds distributed as part of your estate has consequences. And number three, a memorandum of valued property may be referenced as Denise mentioned in your will. And your estate attorney is a valuable in, in, invaluable in a discussion of such a plan, which may include transferring valuable objects into your living trust. And number four, you may want to donate to a charity as well as give objects to your heirs. And that needs legal or tax professional help to do so after you leave the planet. And of course, I would suggest you discuss with your professionals giving objects now um, whilst you are on the planet. And finally, as Denise mentioned, one of my oh, favorite things to talk about is this idea of fairness. And the times that I've counseled my clients working through uh, an appraisal for equitable distribution on the basis of fairness. Okay. Think about what you consider as fair. Now think about what your kids would consider as fair. So I'll give you an example. My mom, who's 93, has for years sent the same gift amount each holiday to each of us. And there's four, even though one brother is so wealthy, he doesn't need any gifts. And that's fair to her. Another relative of mine has a disabled child and heaps gifts upon that child. Uh, and that is fair to all the other children in the family. Another client of mine thinks it's fair to give the bad paintings to the son who never calls on Sunday and the really good paintings to the kids that always call. So think about this, equitable is different than fair. And there's a whole class of objects called treasured or cherished possessions. That is a term in the law and that has a different valuation methodology. So those are the things like the egg cup uh, that broke up the warmth between two sisters that really caused the problems because objects are symbols of love and concern. You may be saying, who cares? I won't be around, but who knows? You might hear the turmoil from whence you go, below or beneath. And when have you ever let your kids sort out important matters and not worried about it later? I ask you. So right now, Denise and I are going to ask each other a few questions, and then we've got a real treat for you which is at the end of the talk, we're going to give you our, each our professional best practices in really quick sound bites that I think you'll enjoy. And so Denise, a question for you. What do you think in your own will, for example, the difference between the specific and general uh, behests, how have you designed that for your own family? I've been thinking actually about redoing mine, but my current um, my current will actually has a few specific bequests, but I've taken an entire category because you can also uh, delve into this by item or by category. I've taken my entire category of jewelry and asked that my best friend Linda distribute it according to what she knows about my friends and families um, and that I've talked to her in advance about this rather than going through every item. Now that's taking a risk, but that's how I've dealt with it right now. I may rethink a lot of this, you know, especially after this year. So I wanted to, and, and I am leaving a number of charitable gifts as well. And um, 
So Elizabeth. Yes, ma'am. You and I both mentioned um, charitable telling giving. Telling the stories, telling the stories. Yes. So, uh, let me let me talk about a colleague. I've never forgotten this story. Um, who told me that everyone was looking at the Franciscan China after her father passed, and nobody wanted it. And you know, millennials or not, you know, people have their own things and start thinking about uh, something else to bring in the house. So. Um, so another relative went down to the basement, started bringing up shoe boxes full of receipts and started telling the story of how the father had purchased one piece at a time of this entire humongous set of Franciscan dishware during World War II when he was serving, one at a time to give to his own mother uh, because he loved her so much and, and he had this income coming in. Um, so they went through all the receipts, kind of saw how long it took. And then they all wanted the Franciscan wear, you know, which then of course created the problem of now what do we do? And, and you were telling me about a story of uh, a large amount of China and how okay, it should so, so I think what you're referring to is uh, two, two points. Denise and I worked together for about 13 years on various projects. And the, what's important, I think, to mention is that there's an underlying theme that we are attempting to bring home to you today, which is that if you don't tell the story of your objects in some way, that you miss a part of their worth. So the idea of value is one thing, it's a dollar figure. Worth has intrinsic other elements by definition. So the value is the dollar figure. Worth includes the narrative. It includes things like family history, provenance. Provenance is important because it's from wh whence it came. And it also encompasses, for example, the celebrity um, connection or the historical um, steps along the line. So, you know, it would even include so much as like you have a, a painting from your Aunt Mildred and she was a terrible painter. Well, if she was taught by John Singer Sargent, that provenance increases value greatly. So it's in the narrative of things. And I'll give you another example, Denise. Let's say you've got a pocket watch, which is $150 by value of the object, but its worth is greater if you include your great-grandfather's timetable from the railway line he worked for, the schedule around the trains, his uh, watch fob that was, all of these things are part of the narrative. They're part of the story. So what Denise and I were talking about as we were working through our talking points for this lecture was the importance of you guys understanding that now is a great time to tell the stories about these objects. And what she's also talking about is the idea of worth as a collection. So she mentioned that I had a client that had a mass of China. Now let's say it's a mice in service for 24. She's got two daughters. She calls me and she says, I want 12 to go to one daughter and 12 place settings to go to another daughter. Well, the problem with that is she's just taken about 50% of the value away from that set. And when I explained that to her, and I also said, Denise, you know, the value is one thing, but the worth is different. So what we determined in that conversation was that she didn't care about the value, she cared about the worth, because as a matter of fact, this was her great grandmother from Germany's set, and it was more important to divide it and keep it with the two daughters than it was to have one daughter own it and have that value be greater. So that idea of value and worth is, I think, what you were talking about. Thank now, you. Yeah. Ask me another question. <laughs> well, <laughs> and, and just to turn. kind of recap on all of that, my husband's grandmother made, did something interesting. She had a little stick on dot, you know, firmly affixed to the bottom of practically everything in her house, but definitely all of the knickknacks, clocks and things. 
and she kept a little log. Uh, every one of those dots had a number on it and her little log was a sequential number. And she wrote down what the item was, when she got it, where she got it and why she liked it. Well, when we all sat down after she passed and read her book and looked at all the items, Quentin and his siblings and his parents, uh, we just spoke among ourselves and decided how to divide it. It was easy and it was meaningful. Yeah, so what you're referencing is a method that you can think about now, dear listener, you can think about a method to inventory things. And so these are pretty easy methods. You know, Denise is talking about a book where you're writing things down. You can actually, what I do is I, you know, on the back of everything. So here's that sculpture that my son doesn't want. This is what it is. And on the bottom of everything, I put a little uh, sort of cheat sheet so that, you know, things don't end up as, um, as attractive as this is. <laughs> <laughs> that that may not end up at the goodwill. So, you know, there's a, there's ways to do that that are using technology. I mean, there's inventory systems. Another favorite way, some of my clients, you know, they just take photos and they put them, you know, in a file on the computer with captions, you know, telling what things are. And it's important when you talk about, as Denise was saying, what things are, you know, who, who gave them to you, uh, where, where it was purchased, maybe even an idea of what you think it's worth, um, perhaps. Uh, so, so what you're doing is you're telling the story a little bit. I think the best way to do it is to just take this, this weekend and have somebody, you know, take, take that phone and just have somebody record you going around the house in every room you stop at, you know, one half of a wall and you say, this is what's important here. This is the story of what's important here. Now you go to the other half. This is what's important here. So it's fairly easy to do. Then you archive that. At least it's a start. And um, because, you know, I made the mistake of um, getting one of those pods and cramming it full with stuff from a storage locker when my son bought his first house. And he was first married and just sent them the pod, but I had no explanation for anything. And so half of it ended up at Goodwill. You know, the idea is that it, you want to sort of speak that narrative while you can, because you're on the planet now. Because once you're gone, sometimes those narratives are lost. And it's easy to do. It just takes mm, maybe two days of working through the house. And like I said, Denise, you, you don't want to get bothered by the, the stuff, the egg beater, I call it, in the kitchen drawer back there. You just don't want to get bogged down with the small. Start with the best. I, I agree that starting with the best will keep the, will drive more momentum. But on the flip side of that, because you just mentioned pod and that made me think of my best friend, Linda. Um, her mother was a bit of a pack rat and had four or five storage, uh, rent, rental storage spaces that she had had probably for decades. Um, Linda not only got to go through everything in the house because her brother was disabled after her parents passed, she had to go through all five storage lockers. She deeply resented the time and energy. Um, so, I right. Think. Okay. So, my solution to that would be if you um, want to leave the small stuff alone for now, or you want to leave it to your kids, I, I would actually put it. What I did, Denise, was I put a provision in my will directing my son to, I have a certain favorite liquidation company that I use for clients, directing that liquidation company to be called. And I actually have spoken to the gals and said, you know, when I leave the planet, my son's going to give you a call because you're going to take care of the category that he doesn't want to take care of the small stuff. So, you know, if you job it out. And yes, I mean, the idea is that you do pay a certain per consignment percentage to do that. But you're really right, Denise, when you say this, this cloud of resentment that mom or or 
or the, if you feel that resentment sometimes as executor, uh, look at what I have to deal with. I'd really rather deal with the really great stuff. But my point is that to jump into this idea of what you're going to do with your personal property, don't worry about the small for now. Jump I, into it. Jump into it with the with the important stuff of value and worth now. And then you can, you know, worry about the small stuff as you go down the path. But if you start with, for example, researching a really good painting or reaching out to an appraiser to help you with such a, a, a valuable uh, painting, you're learning how that value is um, valued now and is projected into the future. And so you're learning sort of the ropes of uh, basic estate planning with um, personal property with untitled property, instead of starting with the egg beaters, you're not learning anything when you're starting with the egg beaters. So start with what you can learn from, I think. And because so many of us have been at home, you know, I look at all of the things in my own house and start feeling overwhelmed. Yeah. But um, some people talk about categorizing as being helpful. That's can right. Can you share some ideas about that? Yes. So there was a very famous book written in the 60s by a really famous Americana furniture dealer, Israel Sachs. And Israel coined the term good, better, best. And so if you go through the house and like I'm suggesting, you're narrating each room, you know, collection, children's books, da, 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 19th century, da, you're narrating, I bought these, I bought this, da, 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 my husband gave me blah, blah, blah. So you're narrating this, but what you're also doing is you're starting to think good, better, best. So what is good in the house that you really would like people to know about on the worth side and you want people to understand on the value side, then you are actually going to good, better, best. And so, and this is not, People say, well, how do I know what's best when I don't know what it's worth? I mean, first of all, we're talking about worth here. If you know, if you have an idea of what it's worth, that's great. But you in your heart kind of know what's good in your house and what's better and what's best. You know, for example, I think we were taught a huge lesson when we had to do, you know, three evacuations in the fires. People grabbed things that they considered the best instinctively that they could carry. I mean, I had a guy that had um, a Pizarro in his uh, VW van wrapped in a beach blanket. You know, he, he grabbed that when he was leaving. So you kind of know what's the best and start there because you'll learn a lot when you do. And, and Denise, a question for you. When, when you're working with um, your professional, for example, when you when you go to see your estate attorney, when you're trying to start this process with your professionals, uh, what should you bring with you to start that conversation? Well, I mean, if you've actually sat with uh, heirs in advance and kind of worked out some of the details, you obviously want to bring all of those thoughts with you. Uh, it would be helpful to bring pictures. It would be helpful perhaps to have receipts. You know, you were talking about the better items. Uh, of course, any uh, appraisals that you actually have, you know, uh, whether they're old or new, that's something to be discussed and assessed as well. Um, so what, what you're saying is it would be a good idea to have the conversation with your kids at least, or your heirs, your heirs. you know, and, and then, your you friends. know, a, a thing that Rochelle brought up while we were kind of brainstorming, Denise and I together was, Rochelle was saying, you know, in regards to charitable giving. So let's say you want to give an object to um, the Natural History Museum, for example. Every charity has a um, standard by which they accept objects. And so you can't just assume that, you know, uh, any particular, uh, it's 501c3 not-for-profit status organization will accept what you want to give them. So the idea is, you know, let them know that you're interested in giving either now when you're alive or after you leave the planet. And the other important thing to talk about, Denise, with charitable giving is that 
if you're giving an object, it's different from giving money because uh, if you're giving an object that is valued, fair market value between um, $1 and $5,000, you don't need somebody like me who's a certified appraiser to write you, it's called an appraisal for 8283 form IRS tax, federal tax deduction. You don't need me if it's 5,000 or less per object or for collections of objects, but you do need a certified appraiser to sign off on that federal document, that 8283 form, if the object you are giving is 5,000 or more. And you should also know that there are certain categories that since you're taking the deduction against your gross, you know, your income taxes, there's certain value categories that the IRS likes to look at more than not. And that particular category is the category between 5,000 and 20,000. That's the area of donation that they scrutinize because that's the area that most people tend to give in and, and mess up in, in that area. So, you know, that's another thing about charitable, charitable giving, it's different. So when you're talking with your attorney and you're discussing that, you know, in Denise's case, she's <clears throat> got in her will, she wants to give some stuff uh, to various charities. You know, she's already pre-qualified that with her charities and she's also understanding that things over 5,000, she's got to call me to help her with. You know something else to discuss um, with your professional advisors is that there's certain personal property uh, that you, for federal or local laws, uh, have certain dictates. Oh this yeah. This would include firearms, um, bat, banned sub substances such as ivory, even fine wine collections. Um, That's right. So, I mean, you need to tell your advisors about such things. So, so that Denise, can, what, yeah. because we're getting close to the time. I see How, that. Should we do, you want to do your best practices and I'll do mine? Yeah. Tell me a couple of, and everybody, you are going to get handouts as part of this um, that include some very specific uh, suggestions and tips from us, but we're going to share a couple real quickly before we go to questions. So and Elizabeth, my, we do have a, a couple questions. So right, we're going to say we we're going to blow through these, Rochelle, and then we're going to do some questions uh, because we promised our our ten best practices. I'll just talk real fast. Define what you want to give as the worth versus the value. Identify the generations you want to give to. Use your experts. Start making virtual piles. Great stuff. Good stuff. Household stuff. Weed the bottom out if you can, but start at the top. Make an inventory on video of your home, like now. <laughs> this is also good for insurance, by the way. When you make the video, tell the story of the objects using modern technology. People are like, well, I can write it in a book. I can put it in a shoebox in three by five cards, but your, your millennials are not gonna appreciate that. So use modern technology. Give objects away that you do not want as soon as you can and put them on the curb if necessary. Document your conversations if you are an executor. Speak to your accountant about capital gains if you decide to sell, sell something of value and make sure your kids understand that concept of capital gains if you leave them something of value. Do not be afraid to face stuff. It's only stuff. Good, better, best, start with the best. Your kids will be happy for the best. And in my experience, they're kind of marginal on the good and the better. Anyway, Denise, those are my 10. Okay. And I would say, you know, keep in mind and recognize that personal property decisions have powerful consequences, both emotional and economic. You should start the process as early as possible for peace of mind. Planning ahead is going to offer more options, a chance for more thoughtful input from others and decision making and communication will help ensure that uh, your decisions better reflect your actual wishes. And as we said, it gives you time to tell those stories. 
Uh, I would gather input and make no assumptions, ask others to identify what has special meaning to them or otherwise address it in meaningful ways. We all tend to make assumptions, perhaps based on gender. You know, sometimes the son wants something that isn't left to him because no one's ever asked. Um, identify your goals before making decisions because that's going to drive your decisions. Um, be sure to tr select transfer methods that fit your goals, um, whether that's gifting, selling, donating, and uh, put things in writing for sure. And be careful with second marriages <laughs> and um, in how, how you want to word and address uh, things going forward. And be careful of outlaws. It's it's never your son. It's your son's wife that's going to screw this stuff up. In my opinion. <laughs> if that's in we got ten minutes. Maybe we should do questions, Denise. Yeah. So read read your lists when you get them. We we hope they help you get started. Yeah. When you so, get your get our handouts that we got that we got for you, then you'll it'll it'll be easy to get started. Hey, Rochelle, how about some questions? Good. Good. Thank you, Elizabeth and Denise. Those were great uh, final tips there. <laughs> we had a serious question here. Uh, mother has a trust, but doesn't does not include specific objects. She now has dementia, so it is so so is not capable of making decisions of distribution of tangibles. What are your suggestions of well, equitable capacity issues? I'm sorry. But her the mom is no longer with us. Yeah, she she no longer has the capacity to make a legal decision. Uh, and by the way, the museum does a, a more comprehensive estate planning workshop in November of every year. This is something we discuss and get a little more into uh, at that time. We hope you join us. But capacity issues must be considered in advance. Um, at this point, uh, her successor trustee or executor is going to have to deal uh, with issues and making those decisions. It never hurts to sit everyone down and talk to them along the lines of things we've already talked about. But, thank, thank you, Denise. Um, and that the two hour workshop and it will be on Sunday, November the 21st from three to five. And that's as Denise stated, that is more comprehensive and it's been very popular. Um, we had another question about pets. Are pets considered tangible property? Pets actually are considered tangible personal property. Yeah, I left um, my estate to my dog. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in many states, you're now allowed to um, create a specific pet trust. Um, where you can uh, leave money and, and define things. Uh, not all planners want to do it in a trust. You can also set aside uh, specifics in your other estate planning documents. Um, and I can provide a, a longer answer to this person later. But since you brought up pets, for anyone who has livestock or horses, Keep in mind that you're going to have to have a plan that goes into effect immediately because of the, of the care, and you're going to need qualified people to provide that care. So, uh, yes, pets and other, and other animals need to be considered in all this planning. I think I see some appraisal questions. Yes. Um, uh, if it, here's a, a question from a participant. If an organization doesn't ask for appraisal of an item that is valued at more than $5,000, what are the legal requirements? So the legal requirements, well, well basically, if it's, if it's objects over 5,000, then you're, you're required to have um, uh, an appraisal, appraiser sign the 8283 form and prepare that for you. Um, and so- That's the you deduction, know, right? Well, if you're interested in taking it as a deduction. Now, if you're just interested in giving it, 
you know, you don't need to, to do this form. If you don't care about having the deduction or in, you know, we've got these new tax rules um, that were in place, you know, 2016. And so basically if you don't, if you, if you don't need a deduction and you wanna give anyway, you don't need that form and you don't need to hire an appraiser. Is, do you think that answers that question? And of course, consult your CPA. Yeah, that's right. The final arbiter, my boss in these uh, situations is always the client CPA. So they, and each CPA has their own thoughts about what the IRS likes and doesn't like. And I, as a representative of an organization, I would suggest uh, this individual have a conversation with the gift officer at the charity uh, about the item and about a possible appraisal. So it's, um, it's nothing to be afraid of. All the ones in town are very friendly and helpful and we could, we could help define uh, and answer that question better for you. Um, there's a question about if you have made your list in your inventory, wonder, wonder if you change your mind. Wonder if you get mad at a brother and want the person out of the picture. What's the best way to deal with that? Well, I can take okay. that one, or but both Denise and I can take that one, but I'll start by saying, if you do a list and you've referenced the list, the memorandum in your will, the dates have to kind of coincide. So Denise, take it from there. Well, if in your will, you say you take the most recently dated memorandum, then you can create a new memorandum, sign and date it. Do not cancel, do not cross out anything on the old one or handwrite changes. You do have to redo it, but it is easier than redoing an entire trust or will. That is kind of one of the motivations behind doing a, a memorandum or list. You can re-execute it more easily, but you will have to do that. Okay, that, that's very good, that's great. Um, so this might be our last question because we just have a minute or so. And uh, Elizabeth, I believe these are for you. Um, how do you know when you have to call an appraiser? If you, have you ever gone to a home and found nothing of value that was an appraisal? And is the fee structure hourly or what? Yeah, so all certified appraisers work on an hourly basis only, not never a percentage of value because then we'd call our brother-in-laws and say, hey, we just valued a Picasso for $5, you know. So it's an hourly rate only. And you, you call an appraiser when you're interested in finding the value, when you're interested in insuring, when you're interested in just like an overview. So, you know, for example, our firm, we go to the house, it's $125 for an hour of our time. I travel with John, the photographer from our staff, and we go and we just take a look at everything in the house. We say, well, these are the things that I think um, you should maybe think of. What's really helpful if people say to an appraiser, I am interested in you pointing out the things to me that are worth over 5,000, let's say, or 500, let's say. And then we are, you know, we, we are preconditioned to go in and say, you know, these are the things that I think in research we should probably uncover uh, that are going to be of that value ceiling or floor that you give us. And since the pandemic, you know, I haven't really gone in it to anybody's house for a year. So, I mean, I, I'm besieged with photographs. People send me whole, you know, thousands of photos to look at in uh, and ascertain what is worth taking a further look at what's worth appraising, what's worth putting in a legal document. And so, the, you know, we would precondition that, but a lot of it's driven by the client. The client would say, you know, I'm, I'm interested to know what I have that's worth over a thousand. Okay, now we're off and running. Great. Well, thank you, Denise and Elizabeth. Uh, this has been great information. And as we stated earlier, you will be receiving a link to the program if you or perhaps one of your heirs or loved ones would like to look at it with you in, a, in addition to two other handouts. And also, please feel free to um, uh, 
contact me if you have any other estate planning questions. I'm also looking for topics that are interesting in the future. We're going to have two more of these this year. If you have any uh, interest in donating uh, a valuable uh, object or perhaps a collection to the museum, um, we would welcome that conversation. You can contact me, Caroline Baker, the Director of Development, or Luke Swetland, who did our, our welcome. Uh, is there anything else, uh, Denise or Elizabeth or Luke, you would like? Well, I noticed there's like 19 questions in the chat room. And, and if, if I can be helpful, I mean, folks can email me. And if it's a quick question, I'm, I'm really happy to answer. Yeah. What, we will get back to every question that, that has not been answered. But we, knew, we do want to respect everybody's time and thank you for your interest in the museum and for learning more about estate planning. Luke, would you like to say a, a final farewell? You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> love you, love what you're doing. Thanks for being such good friends to the museum, ladies. Okay, folks, we're signing off. Thank Bye -bye. you, Santa Barbara. Ciao.